I'm Park Howell, and welcome to the Business of Story, where I consult, teach, coach, and speak on the applied science and bewitchery of brand and business storytelling, so that you can clarify your story to amplify your impact and simplify your life. I thought it was just a stupid picture of a pig in the ocean. But after hearing that story, I had to have it. Now I wasn't just buying a picture. I was buying a story. Story literally made the picture worth more money to me. That's what businesses are about. People buy brands. People buy stories much more than anything else. I work with a lot of big enterprise companies, but let's just say I always tell folks, drop the PowerPoint, close your laptops, start with your story. If you want people to get engaged and you want people to act, you have to tell them an emotionally powerful story. That's with great characters, it's with uncertain outcomes, and it's with high stakes and drama. All business strategy is a story. Hey folks, welcome back to the Business of Story. Park Howell here. I don't know about you, but one of my favorite all-time cartoonists was Gary Larson grew up with him. In fact, we went to the same university, Washington State University. He graduated a few years ahead of me, but he always cracked me up. His cartoons were so simple and yet so hysterical. I love the one, by the way, where the two spiders are sitting down at the bottom of the slide and they've spun a web. Um, This is like a slide on a playground park and there's a fat little chubby kid up top just about ready to come down the slide and one spider looks at the other one and says, if we pull this off, we're going to eat like kings. So that's the kind of humor that I love. And the simplicity of his artwork, I always tried to do that stuff and I could never do it. The one thing, in addition to be able to sing decently, seeing how I'm a musician and all, the one other thing that I would love, always love to do is to doodle, to do cartoons and have the fun. I do them, but they look horrendous. And I'm always sort of embarrassed, so I just kind of push them aside. But I do know I doodle a lot in meetings, good, bad, or indifferently. Well, one of the areas that we have not over the past three years covered a lot in, and that is visual storytelling, especially in the cartoon business, the cartooning industry as it relates to business in general. So today we have a special guest on our show who actually worked with me earlier this year in helping me create a cartoon vision of the TEDx Gilbert talk that I gave back in April. Lisa Rothstein, who will be joining us, is an award-winning Madison Avenue ad agency copywriter, of all things. Not an art director, but a copywriter and a creative director, best known for creating the famous Wait Till We Get Our Hands On You campaign that changed America's underwear forever. I mean, literally, it was that epic. In her consulting business, Creativity to Cash International, Inc., She uses speaking, cutting-edge brand strategy, facilitating brainstorming sessions, writing, and what we're going to be covering today, cartooning, to help corporations and entrepreneurs see their ideal clients, products, mission, and brand stories in new and very unforgettable ways. Lisa is a published New Yorker cartoonist, so right there she's got some street cred in my book, a featured author and illustrator in several Amazon best-selling books, and Lisa enjoys teaching copywriting and cartooning in her online courses. She is the co-author of the blog and upcoming book, The Da Vinci Dilemma, How Multi-Talented People Can Get More Done and Get More Joy Out of Life. She's a native New Yorker, a former NYC street performer, which I got to hear what she was doing out there, and a graduate of Brown University. She now lives in San Diego with her husband, Jim Benson, a radio talk show host. So folks, today, Lisa and I are going to cover a few things, and I hope they will help you in your own visual storytelling and cartoon tuning in, you know, doodling, why words can fall short in storytelling, even for us good writers, and how, you know, we can prop those up with just the right images, the right visuals, why hand drawings or doodles are better at expressing ideas than photos actually are, how and why her very first New Yorker cartoon went viral, that's what I would really like to hear about, and how drawings help in storytelling and in drawing people together. Finally, she's going to have to answer that big question that I began with. 
that whole idea of I can't draw as being a lie, well, I'm not sure if I'm lying or not. I just don't think I've had the talent, but maybe I do. And how everyone can get started using their own doodles in their communication. So let's dive right into this cartooning visual storytelling episode with Lisa Rothstein. Lisa, welcome to the show. Hey, Park. So happy to be here. Well, I love this. Uh, you know, the fact that you and I, 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 we actually first got acquainted, I think, at uh, Social Media Marketing World mm-hmm. earlier this year. That's right. Well, actually, last year, that would be 2018, by the time folks are hearing this show, we got acquainted there. And then when I was doing my TEDx Gilbert talk, we got reconnected somehow, and I was looking for help in visualizing and bringing my presentation together not so much where I would be using it up on the screen, but for me to be able to visualize and memorize it. And you end up doing this wonderful doodle, capturing my story cycle of my, my overall TEDx talk, which I then use as handouts. And I'll, in fact, include them in the notes. So really great having you here and actually working with you in the cartooning world. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. And but you, you really touched on something important there because you I remember you did say, I want to be able to remember my talk so that I can it's basically like visual notes for yourself. And and so it ended up being something that we that you ended up using, you know, with your audience too. But the great thing about that was, you know, how long was that talk? Like 90 minutes, maybe? <laughs> no, no, it seemed like 90 minutes, maybe to some, but it was only 18 minutes. Although it, it's, you know, you pack a lot of information in that 18 minutes and you want to keep it consistent. You can't really, you know, ad lib because you don't have time for that. So you got to right. stay on script, on task without it sounding like it's totally memorized and using your illustrations of my 10-step story cycle that took me from chapter to chapter through my script was immensely helpful because I could picture it. If I did find myself kind of straying or getting lost, I would just simply go back to that single sheet that you illustrated for me, two colors, black and and red, so it, it mirrored the colors of my brand, and I was able to take my memory visually through my presentation. Well, the reason I asked about how long it was, because you could probably take, do that same talk. I know you do workshops and things. You could, mm-hmm. I know you sometimes, you could do the same thing over three days that you did in 18 minutes, just a little bit longer. But the thing is that that visual was just literally one page and it basically kind of held your entire concept in that one kind of telegraphic visual. And so that's what one of the things I wanted to talk about. And that is that how, how cartoons and doodles can, can instantly communicate a lot of, I mean, you hear a picture is worth a thousand words. It's a cliche and everybody says it, but the, the truth is that you've got, you've got like one, one page or one image or an image with multiple images inside it that are able to, in an instant, remind you and prompt you. And, you know, the people who actually saw you, who got it as a handout can look at that one page and remember everything that you said, even yeah. if it had been three days long. It's like capturing the little anecdotes that are with inside the stories inside your overall big story. And you're right. You can catch it in a single frame and it automatically pieces it back together in your mind. But Mm -hmm. Lisa, you didn't start off as a cartoonist. Give us your backstory. And when did you find yourself moving into this direction? Well, I mean, I've always drawn cartoons ever since I was a little kid. In fact, I, the first thing I ever bought with my own money was uh, a little sort of paperback book of Charles Schultz Snoopy cartoons. <laughs> That's appropriate. When I was like five, um, it was 40 cents. <laughs> That's how long ago <laughs> this was. I still have it. I have it on my desk as a reminder. And it was all I ever really wanted to do was be a cartoonist when I was a kid. And my parents from the, the, the depression literally told me, you're going to be out on the street selling pencils. If I try to, <laughs> you're not going to be using pencils. You're going to be yet. selling pencils. Exactly. So even though I was pretty good at it, or I thought I was, I, and I really loved it. I, um, I realized that, well, this is probably not a viable idea for a career. So um, as I got older and I realized I was also a pretty good writer, I started doing writing more as a, as a thing. And then I always loved advertising. I, I was one of those kids who would sit and watch the commercials and leave during the programs. And then when I found out you could do that for a job, I thought, well, that sounds like, you know, something I would do for free. So I ended up, you know, uh, getting recruited out of college to go to a, a big advertising agency, Young and Rubicam, right out of college. And, um, and I've spent about 25 years in the ad agency business, both in New York and all over Europe. 
as a copywriter. And I actually would have was kind of hoping to get recruited as an art director, but either because they're both, you know, if you ever watched like the old show 30 something mm -hmm. or even Mad Men, that the, the, the way it works in advertising is you have a team of a writer and an art director together. And that's who makes that. That's basically the, the unit that creates all the creative that you see on TV, um, you know, old fashioned television commercials and things like that. And there's a whole hierarchy, but it's a team of a, of a copywriter and an art director. And I would have gone in as either one, but uh, I got the job in copywriting. And so that's where I stayed all those years, but I always drew on the side. You know, I was always the one that people always asked if they had, if they needed a birthday card drawn for somebody or somebody mm -hmm. was retiring and they needed one of those big boards that people could sign to, you know, to say goodbye. What did you study in college? I stopped oh God. It's going to sound so esoteric. Um, at the time I went to Brown, uh, there was something, they don't even have it anymore. They called something else. There's, there's a field of study called semiotics, which you may know since you're into story. Semiotics is the study and the, the study of the theory of signs and symbols, and it is exactly as esoteric and intellectual. <laughs> yeah, and, like semaphore that they yeah. use for, for okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's exactly as, as, as you know, beer, sm tiny beard, tiny ponytail wearing as it sounds. And, uh, but what it did was it helped, it allowed me to put a lot of different things into my, into my major, including some, some studio art and things like that. Well, and did it marry the two worlds that you were interested in writing communication and art direction design? Because that's kind of what semiotics does. Does it try to communicate something very quickly with an image? Well, it does, and it does, and yet I didn't really care for it very much because if you actually, it's not. This is not that interesting. But if you did, if you, if you learn anything about semiotics, what it does is it takes all the joy out of any any piece of artwork. It's very uh, um, kind of um, scientific way of of looking at what they call a text. So, you know, the the fact that it would might tell a story is really almost like sort of irrelevant to to what to how to oh, how to, wow. you know like it's it's it and the backstory behind a piece of art or, or a text is really kind of you're not supposed to even think about those things yeah so, so in, in a way it was kind of um you know I, I discovered well it's interesting that you can look at something in this kind of in this in this kind of bloodless sort of uh, <laughs> removed way but I really love what I, what I love about cartooning what I love about all kinds of um, artistic expression is the way that it does touch your emotions and that it does like instantly um, communicate something the meaning that the that the author or the or the or the or the artist meant to 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 um, to communicate in semiotics it's really all about the reader creating the text mm -hmm. but, you know all about like well you know if you didn't know anything about Charles Dickens and you just picked up Oliver Twist and didn't know anything about his history and the fact that he was that he worked in a factory and and knew all and, and experienced all of those kinds of um, uh, hardships firsthand as a, as a as a young man. I mean, to me, that makes it that makes my experience of of the text much richer to know where it came from and, and what it was intended. But but in semiotics, you're not supposed to, you're not even supposed to go there. So that wasn't happening. So you graduated yeah. and you got into Young and Rubicam, which yeah, it was one, one yeah, of the real, real biggies. And you did a lot of writing and creative directing there. Now, first question, you know, we were talking, right? I mentioned in my open when you say when words fall short, what did, did you have an experience when you felt like you were just had the best words in there, but it just wasn't working? Well, in ads, not so much, but, but I, do, but in meetings and things, I've always, I've, you know, people will sit there and they talk at each other. Um, and then when, and, and they say a lot of things and they, and they use a lot of big words and people, and, and you could sometimes see that what one person meant, the other person didn't really get, or it wasn't really landing. They're talking past each other. You see that a lot in, um, mm -hmm. in meetings and in, in, in the corporate world. And then also when people, uh, write copy for themselves on their websites and things like that, it's a lot of big kind of bloviating jargon and, and, and doesn't really, it doesn't really mean anything. And I think because they get kind of self-conscious about, about, about their words and, it, and words can be so easily misinterpreted when, when people, when people speak to each other. So I, I always found that, that sitting and drawing something um, just like, you know, when you always hear about the back of a napkin, kind of a sketch and things like that, it's because it's just an easier, faster way. I'm snapping my fingers here, easier, faster way to communicate something. And it cuts through all the, all the possibility of misinterpretation, it cuts through all the vocabulary. And as much as I love words, sometimes they kind of get in the way. And I find the pictures are a much faster way to communicate things um, and to get people on the same page. 
And why do you think that works? How, is it something the way our brain is hardwired or what have you learned that brings that, those two worlds together, words, but now the cartooning that really anchors the concept in the, an audience's brain? Well, I think we are hardwired for pictures. I mean, you go you go back and you see, I mean, obviously even be pre-language, all the cave paintings and things like that. You can look at that right now and still kind of understand the story that those pictures tell. If if you if you if instead you had to go and read, you know, caveman language in words as to how exactly that buffalo hunt went, it would be it would take a long time and it wouldn't be as easy as, as it is as it is looking at a at the cave painting. And people, I mean, children are, are wired for story. We're all wired for story and wired for, for, for visual story. But at some point people think, well, you're not, you know, picture books and things at some, at some stage in your life, they take the pictures out of the books and you're supposed to just read the books. And it's, it's really kind of sad. <laughs> I've always felt it was kind of sad. And that's why it's funny in um, here in, uh, in the States, but, mo- but even more in, um, in places like France where I lived for over a decade, Graphic novels are very big with grown-ups, you know, they call graphic novels, which is a fancy word for comic books, are very, very big with, uh, you know, with grown men and some women because they're just, you know, pick, those pictures tell a story in, a, in an amazing, in an amazing um, you know, faster and more mm-hmm. emotionally um, involving way than, than just reading about it. And you um, see that more in Europe, France area than you do back here in North America? Well, I think it's becoming more accepted here. But when I was living there, it was it, I, at first I thought it was odd. And then I found out that, you know, that there were a lot of grown men reading, you know, and they really were graphic novels being written for adults. They weren't written for kids. It wasn't like, you know, a guy reading a children's comic book. It was they were they literally were novels, but told in pictures. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like what I used to think of, I used to love classic comics when I was a kid. Um, and I had, I still have a stack of them from when I, you know, do you know the, where they, where they had like the classic novels? Oh, my favorite um, mad magazine. I mean, with all the mad different magazine. styles yeah. and mad mm-hmm. magazine, man, that, that was my favorite. Mm-hmm. And I, and I've always, and the, but for me, the, the best is when you marry words and pictures together um, that's why I love, um, you know, uh, the New Yorker and, and those, and I love Gary Larson too, as you mentioned, I, I, I really loved uh, Charles Schultz all my life and still do. Um, because the, the, the characters plus the, plus the dialogue or the characters plus the captions, you know, just, just adds up to something that just either one by itself couldn't, couldn't possibly do. And, um, so that's, it, being able being able to doodle is not only just about creating a, a cartoon that can run in a magazine. That's one kind of doing. That's one kind of doodling. That's one kind of cartooning. And it's true that that does take you know a bit of practice and, and maybe even some innate talent. But what I love to help people do is learn how to uh, to to do their own their own style, whether or not it's quote unquote good art or not. To me, it's more important that you communicate that it makes sense to other people because. What I love about about uh, about drawing, especially when it comes to doing it in business and in meetings and in communication, is it gets everybody. When I say on the same page, instead of you say this to me and I say that to you, and you say this to me and I say that to you, and it's like a tennis game where where we're on opposite sides of the net. When you when you're look when you're drawing something and then you have to look at it together, then you're both standing on the same side, and you're both looking at something. Or you're, or you're a whole room of people looking at something and you're all discussing the same thing. You're all, or you're all adding to it or you're all commenting on something that you're all observing at the same time. And it, it's, I know it sounds a little bit esoteric, but there's something about that, that, um, that uh, sort of dynamic where you're, you're doing something together and all looking at the same, I've heard it called an artifact, mm-hmm. um, uh, that, that, that makes it more of a team a team effort and a team collaboration and communication than when it's just a dialogue where it's almost like you're trying to convince somebody, persuade somebody or win. And, and this, and in this respect, you're, you're all on the same side. And, and, it, and when I work in, in, in meetings where I'm drawing, they call sketch notes and stuff where I basically take doing visual note taking of a meeting or visual facilitation of a brainstorming session or something. Everybody's contributing to the, to the visual that you end up seeing a big mural that ends up on the wall or a bunch of big, huge post-it notes. Um, and, and everyone feels ownership of what we're all able to look at when it's done and remember everything that everybody said, every contribution that everybody made. And it's just, it's, it's, it's just different than when you don't do that. In a yeah. Meeting. So I never thought about it that way, but narrative 
you know, when someone, when you've got a discussion going on, can sometimes be a zero sum game. Right. Whoever can tell the best story wins quite often. We talk about here as well, where, and, and of course you're trying to win collectively, but I could see where it becomes a zero sum game. I want it my way versus your way. Um, mm-hmm. And it sounds like then with your experience, what you're seeing is in this collective cartooning that happens, people are now coming together and, and creating the story, co-creating the story so that you're coming out with a, a, an outcome that both sides benefit from. Right. They, and, they, and, they, and, they, and, they, and they all feel that they had some part in it. And even when you're sitting just one-on-one with somebody, even if you are doing a back of the napkin thing where you're trying to explain something to somebody, you're inviting them. And this is, this is where this leads into why I think, you know, for this kind of thing, drawing is better, especially hand drawing and live hand drawing is better than, than using photos, even though photos may be more realistic. Um, drawings are more about ideas. Drawings are more symbolic. Drawings are drawings. A, a little, a, a few lines can mean a whole world of ideas. Um, where a photo is literally that thing, that person. You know. So one of the things I love to do with my clients, and I and I, it just happened kind of organically, that I started to do more cartooning in my work. When I work with people on their copy and on their marketing, their brand strategy and things, I'm always drawing, even though I, it's not part of what I sell, but it's just like I was, in a, I was in a VIP strategy day with somebody and she, had, she was shifting her business from one, from one sort of audience to the other. And I was like, well, who's your ideal client now? And we started talking about this person and without really even thinking about it, I put up one of those big giant post-it notes on the wall and I started drawing a cartoon of this person. And what does she look like? What is she wearing? Is she, does she have a husband? Is he supportive? If he's not supportive, he has his arms folded. If he is supportive, he has his arm around her shoulder. You know, are there kids? How old are they? Are they in college? What, you know, and, so, and I just drew everything I could, I, you know, that she said about who this person was. And I, could I have written these things down? Yes. And we would have had pages and pages of notes that you would have had to read and think about. But when we were done, instead of that, we had a big poster of this person and all of her thought balloons and voice balloons coming out and all of her dreams and hopes and everything on one page. And even, and, and because we had drawn it together, I mean, I was drawing and she was talking, but because we had created this, this image together, she felt really connected to this person, even though this person was a fictional, you know, made up person in our own mind, but she felt more real than if we had pulled a, like sometimes people will say, you know, pull a, pull a, uh, a photograph out of a magazine and imagine that's your ideal client. And I, I, I hate that idea. Because I know I looked at that photograph and I know that person is not, you know, I know that person is, a, is someone else, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. but when I draw it, it's, um, you know, and, and at the end, I'll share with you a resource that I give, that I give away a lot where I teach you how to draw your own ideal client. And it's a, it's a little bit like a paper doll situation where you can actually trace things off of the, off of the handout that I give you. It's fun. Um, but, but it's just, it's cool to be able to, to see something that you've drawn with somebody or even by yourself that is that, that it just symbolizes everything that you want to to remember about this person. So when did you start really making this move away from the written word, the copywriter? I know you're still using that a lot in your um, world, but you are really focused now on illustration and cartooning. Take us through that evolution of Lisa to where it has found you today and the kind of work that you're doing. Well, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not a, uh, I'm not 20 years old anymore. And so there comes a point in your life when you start to, I mean, this is something that I've always loved doing. And little by little, I, I, I started allowing myself to do a little bit more, a little bit more, you know, of the drawing and bringing it more and more into my business. And also having the, the dream of, you know, I've been published here and there a little bit um, as a cartoonist here and there. Um, but I've always wanted to, to get uh, car- my cartoons in the New Yorker. I mean, it was, that's like the, 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 the sort of bucket list item for anybody who draws, but it's a sort of thing where, oh, well, you hear you have to like submit to them for years before they buy anything. That's, that's usually true. Um, but, um, you know, the more I started using, the more I started drawing in my regular life, the more I started kind of like sort of very sort of almost like pretending pretending I wasn't even doing it myself, kind of like, you know, pre- pretending it was just kind of like accidentally on purpose, more and more getting more involved in it and going to things like San Diego Comic-Con, which I've gone to the, the last few years and meeting with other people who drew cartoons. And I met with a guy who draw, who drew for the New Yorker and he, he saw some of my work. I showed it to him on my phone. He said, you know, you're really good. You should really come down here. You really should come down when you next time you're in New York. And I live in San Diego now. 
And he said, look, I'll show you around. I'll introduce you around. And I thought, well, that's a really generous offer. I and believe. What year was this roughly? This was a couple of years ago. Just this a couple of years ago. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, and so I'm like, but you know, I will tell you Park that I went to New York at least three or four times after he made that offer and didn't even contact him. I didn't even let him know I was there. I didn't, I didn't have the courage to, to, to make this leak because I always felt like I've always been afraid that this is, you know, people won't take me seriously and, you know, and, and, and no one likes rejection. And, and even though I know that everybody gets rejected from the New Yorker, I thought, well, you know, I can't go in there, but um, I was there this past June and I thought this is really stupid. I had, I kept in touch with that fellow for a long time and I thought, okay, I'm just going to tell him I'm here. And, um, and I, I almost didn't, didn't do it. And I, I waited until Tuesday. They see people on, they see cartoonists on Tuesdays. I wait until Tuesday and, um, I waited until Tuesday morning. I was like, well, I don't know. Are you going down to the New Yorker today? Cause I thought I might, he said, oh, you should definitely come. It's, it's at 11. You should come. And I was like, darn it. I, I still have time. I can actually do this today. So I, I printed out a bunch of stuff uh, that I had done over the years and brought it with me. And, and I w- went in to see the editor and she was really nice. And, and she liked a few of the things that I showed her. She actually held on to one or two of them, which didn't mean that they were buying it. But the fact that they, she even thought it was good enough to even like show to anybody made me very, very happy. And then we all went to lunch and it was, it, I, I felt like, okay, I, I could, that, that's, I, at least I've shown my work to like the most important, you know, magazine for cartoons in the whole world. I can be, I can be proud of myself for that. After all these years, I finally, I finally actually did something um, to, to take myself seriously as a cartoonist. So I thought, oh, I'll be in New York for a couple of more weeks. I'm going to go down there every Tuesday while I'm here just to, just to kind of, you know, start a relationship. Then when I send stuff in online, they'll know who I am, but I wasn't expecting anything to happen. Because they, because literally people do do show things consistently for a long, long time before they get anything accepted. So, what happened was I drew a bunch of stuff that week, and you know it was okay. But I thought, well, you know, I'll just go in and I'll have a meeting. And this was around the time that, uh, that and I'm not a political cartoonist at all. Mm -hmm. But this was around the time that Donald Trump and Kim Kim Jong Un of North Korea were having their first summit meeting and everybody was freaking out and, and so you're talking and, about june of 2018 yeah june of yeah. 2018 the very the first time they met and you know this was after he'd called him rocket man and all this stuff <laughs> right and and i'm and i and the i was in, i was in new york watching this on television and um and i was thinking i saw them shaking hands and and they were saying you know the two of them are going to go into a room together by themselves just with translators just the two of them and I thought that is that is just funny. This, I, what could they possibly be talking about? These two these two characters in a room together. And I went to bed. And the next morning, I woke up and I was getting ready to go down to the New Yorker. Which I had to go on the subway about half an hour downtown to One World Trade Center, which is where they are right now, Condé Nast. And I had an idea. And I, I grabbed a piece of paper and a pencil. Literally, I wasn't using my iPad yet for this. I didn't even have it yet. And I just scribbled a little a little sketch of the two of them, Trump and Kim um, looking at an iPhone and Trump is saying to Kim, then you just hit tweet and the whole world goes crazy. (laughs) I mean, you're not even seeing the picture and you're laughing. So I thought this is silly. This is funny. And I I thought, well, this is nothing that they would ever be interested in because by the time they would run this in the magazine, this this would be, you know, old news because magazine, print magazines take, weeks for them even if they bought it that day it takes weeks to, to to come out by the time it came out people wouldn't even know what this was even about anymore but i thought i'll just show it to them just to um, and, and you sketched this on the on the trip over there essentially. well but basically just as i i had my coat on to yeah. go i mean not my coat on but i had my shoes on i was i was on my way out the door and i thought oh let me just scribble this down just so i can have something to show her to show how i can come up with an idea fast because obviously this had just happened the day before so i thought well this will show that i've got you know that i can come up with a quick idea so i went down there and, you know, you basically, you put your name on a list. The way it works at the New Yorker is everybody puts their name on a piece of paper that's outside the, 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 the office where the editor is seeing cartoonists. And I, I took a picture of the list every time I went down there because there are all these famous names on there that I had been looking at my whole life. There's a guy, Sam Gross, who's been, who's like an idol of mine, who's been showing cartoons to them for like 50 years, who was there. And he just puts his name on the list like everybody else. Crazy. By the way, I'm on your Instagram account right now. Is that the list you have photoed there? Because you said Sam Gross. And yeah. I yeah. His name as you said it. Yeah. So yeah. Folks, if you want to see this in action, 
Go to uh, Lisa Rothstein on Instagram, and you can see her work. Okay. Oh my goodness! I should. I should. I, I'm going to have to uh, uh, update my Instagram more often now because I'm. Because <laughs> really, yeah, since I started doing cartooning, people are like, "Are you on Instagram?" It's like you know, people are going to be looking at my account, going, "Well, she used to talk about marketing. Now all of a sudden, there are all these cartoons there." Yeah. So yeah. I basically had like a, a you know a, cha- uh, an, a what do we call it metamorphosis. So so I go down to the to the editor and I show her all the stuff I came up with all week and she was she thought it was nice and she she told me what she liked and didn't like about everything I did gave me some really great feedback and then I I almost forgot to show it to her I said oh I did this this morning I thought it was funny and she looked at it and she in, in a few seconds she said well that could be the daily cartoon and I was like what do you mean the daily cartoon and I forgot that they have this thing with it they put it on the internet like every day they have like the stuff that's more topical and more more um, of the moment that you know, uh, current events and things like that. They have a daily humor uh, newsletter that they send out and they have a daily cartoon on newyorker.com. And, and I thought what she meant was this is the kind of thing that we would use for the daily cartoon. And I was like, oh, okay, that's, that's good to know. She said, well, it's too late for today because it's already noon, but we could run it tomorrow. And I was like, what? I mean, you're, 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 you're talking about actually using this? And she's like, well, you would have to finish it, and we would have to make sure that David liked it, David, David Remnick, the, the editor of the entire magazine. Mm-hmm. And also we have to make sure that, you know, we have to watch the news cycle. And I'm like, oh, you mean like if, 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 if the president says anything or does anything between now and tomorrow morning that would make this n- no longer a funny idea, um, then, then you won't run it. And she's like, that's pretty much it. So I basically prayed all night. That that nobody would say anything or do anything that would that would make that would make this. That Teddy would, that wouldn't would, pull a bonehead would, move and make it, it no void. Yeah, the screw up my screw up my entire dream. But <laughs> sure enough, the next day they said no, we're going to do it, and they they sent me a contract and everything like that. It was really surreal. And then next thing I know, um, I had to finish it the next day. I mean, I had to finish it like like you know make it be more. It was just a little scribble when I showed it to her. And, uh, I, you know, you have to, you have to finish it really fast, like by noon that day. And so I was sitting there with like, like painting with my finger on my trackpad on my computer. Cause I didn't have any, um, any, any like, you know, art supplies or anything with me. Um, and so, but then it, it went up and then in just an hour or two, I started getting emails and phone calls from everybody I knew and people I hadn't seen, I hadn't talked to in years saying, was that you? I saw your name on my, you know, I'm in my, because they sent out the newsletter with, with this thing in it. And um, it was incredible. I've gotten a lot of work off of it and a lot of people paying a lot of attention. I've, they, I've been down to the New Yorker since then. Um, I haven't, they haven't run anything yet, but they've kept a few things of mine that I've, that I've, saw, that I've shown them even just last week. I'm crossing my fingers for the things that they're holding right now. So um, it's, it's, I went from never having been in there to, to now yeah. being like a member of the, a member of the club and, and everything. It's crazy. I get emails from them all the time now. And it's, 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 and here you are afraid of going in and doing that. I know that's, Isn't so that's that interesting a, as that a lesson to you? you were in storytelling. Yeah. All the work you've done around the world, it was still putting yourself out there and being vulnerable and saying, Hey, let me show them or, you know, the fear of the unknown of like, yeah. oh, what well, if they I mean, look at, you know, like it or I'm a hack or whatever. Exactly. That's exactly what I was thinking. And it just goes to show that, you know, something, I mean, and I, and you know, the other things that went through my mind were, oh, it's too late. I should have done this 30 years ago. I should have done this 20 years ago. I should, you know, should have, would have, could have, you know, it's too late for me. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, the guy, this, this fellow, Sam Gross that I was talking about is like a bazillion years old. And, and, uh, and so I, I mean, I can start now and still have a 35 year career and, and, and if I, if I live to be as, as old as he is. So, so it's, it's, it's all, we tell ourselves so many lies about why we can't do the thing that we love. And I, I've been doing, I've been telling myself that lie um, for a really, really long time. And I still love copywriting. Don't get me wrong. I still love doing all the other things I do and I still do it. But a lot of people who draw for the New Yorker and other magazines don't do, do other things besides being a cartoonist. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, there's a fellow whose name I escapes me right now who teaches med- who teaches at Columbia medical school. Who's a, who's a, um, who's a New Yorker cartoonist. Um, my friend uh, Jason Chatfield who got me in there that day, um, is a fantastic cartoonist in the New Yorker and Mad Magazine and a bunch of other things, but he's also a stand-up comedian and an actor. So um, what, what yeah. goes into this? I mean, when you sit down to do a cartoon, whether it's for the New Yorker or you're working on behalf of a client and you're trying to capture a meeting, 
what are the elements that you think about when you start doing your illustrations that so much so that like a, you know, someone like me who feels like they're all thumbs in illustration and cartooning that some tips that I could use to start thinking about, you know, doing my own version of a New Yorker. Well, here's the thing uh, for the, for the, for things like, like a New Yorker cartoon or a Gary Larson cartoon and stuff like that, the idea is more important than the actual drawing. I mean, it's, it's you know, the drawing that the drawing that he did were the drawings that he did were really, really good, but you can see a lot of very, um, I'd say almost crude stuff in the, in the, um, in the world right now that is, um, you know, the, the drawings themselves are like all practically stick figures, but the idea is what, is what really matters. So people who worry that, oh my God, I don't draw beautifully well and things like that. It really, it really doesn't, it really doesn't, it's not that it doesn't matter, but there are some people who like, I don't, do you remember life is good? The, this whole like yes. brand life is good. That guy, I mean, these doodles are so like, they really are practically stick figures, but they're so charming and they're so fun and they just express a spirit and uh, of, of relaxation and, you know, just chilling out and whatever it is that, that, you know, that became this huge, like multi-million dollar brand. So what I, what I do is when it, when it comes to doing stuff that has to do with humor, you kind of have to figure out, um, you know, like what kind of a, what kind of a joke is like, there's one, there's one that they, that they kind of sort of liked and then they ended up ultimately not deciding not to run, which I was, I was sad about, but there's, um, there are all kinds of cliches that you can make, that you can make fun of there. I had Eve in the garden looking at the apple and the snake is hanging out of the tree and she's kind of, she's kind of considering the apple. And the snake is kind of annoyed and he's saying, the caption says, well, of course it's organic. <laughs> you know yeah. but so you take things so, so in this day and age very yeah. appropriate well mm -hmm. that's the thing you take what you take for me humor is taking there's a lot of different ways to do humor and it's hard and if you have to explain it it kind of takes all the life out of it but one way of making things funny and i think a lot of stuff that runs in, in magazines that are funny are take one thing and something else that's kind of unrelated and make them related so mm -hmm. and so, anachronisms like that are are fun, like something that's happening now and set it in the past or set it in a Bible story or set it in a, um, another famous kind of setting, um, you know, or take, or take a, uh, take a, uh, the, or do the opposite, take a familiar setting, like, a, like the office or the supermarket, or I, I drew something the other day for, um, a cartooning a course that I, that I, that I do when I was showing, showing, um, my students, you know, ways of drawing animals, for example. So I was like, well, what if you take it, you can take an animal and anthropomorphize it, make it like a person. So I, I put an elephant in a supermarket and the elephant is looking at, um, at, at the list as it's, as it's pushing its cart down the aisles and saying, I know I'm forgetting something, but because the elephant never forgets. <laughs> the elephant so said, brain. Yeah, yeah exactly. But, but I mean, so it's the juxtaposition of, of, of different elements that mm -hmm. just, are, that's, but see, you got it right away. And that's what I love about, about, um, about cartoons is that people get it right away. And there's this, there's this visceral, you know, it's, it's, it's so instant instead of having to read pages and pages and pages of something, you get it right away. And so that, that, um, that New Yorker cartoon that, that happened that time. The thing that made me so proud of it was that people just shared it. So many people shared it and, and people from all different um, parties shared it. I, I, it got, it got retweeted. It got like, it's got like 98,000 likes on the, uh, on the, um, oh, New Yorker awesome. cartoon. I know it's mm -hmm. like, it's crazy, but then it also got retweeted and shared by Jake Tapper of CNN. I think his name is Kyle Griffin of MSNBC two commentators from Fox news. So the, so everybody from all across the political spectrum, and then a couple of uh, the Washington post and then a couple of foreign um, outlets, France, France, 24 news and stuff like that. And they all shared it. They all thought it was funny for their own reasons, but they all got something out of it fast, fast enough and quick enough that they thought, oh, I want to show my followers. They were all and, part of the story. Yeah. They were all part of the story. And to me, that that was my favorite part of the story is that, is that for a second, everybody had a laugh instead of, fighting everybody had everybody had a joke for for a couple of seconds and lightened up and that's that's another mm -hmm. thing i love about about cartoons um even when they're not necessarily um especially humorous is that there's a lightness about it and a um and a humanity about it that makes people feel connected to you and it makes people um just uh just connect their their critical skeptical resistant brain to just enter into the story with you isn't that interesting? So you're coming from the written word narrative world into the visual storytelling. 
and just the power in such a simple way that you can have mm -hmm. uh, on bringing people together. So what are you doing mostly today then, Lisa, with your cartooning and illustration work? Well, I, I'm still submitting to, you know, to, the, to the New Yorker and other magazines. Mm -hmm. I'm illustrating um, people's books uh, and a lot of business books. I um, could use uh, a little bit of uh, lighthearted uh, or sophisticated humor. Uh, and, and, and do you drawing. approach those the same way in that you're always kind of looking for the idea that almost like you would a New Yorker when you're illustrating yes. this book? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the people the people who hire me to do to do to work on their books. I'm working on one right now um, called um, the sixth edition of a book called How to Survive Your Freshman Year, um, and it's a it's a, it's basically a crowdsourced sort of compilation of advice from from current college students for kids entering college about how to how to survive a horrible roommate, how to you know figure find find out you know how to choose your classes, you know st study tips and you know all kinds of tips about what life at college is really like for people who are about to go. And um, we're doing a I'm doing a panel cartoon for each of the uh, each of the 21 chapters, and there's there, there's there's stuff about roommates and stuff about the dormitory and stuff about um, um, professors and stuff about dating and. And things like that, and so and so. There's we just find the humor, um, and some of it's not necessarily hysterically funny. It come, a lot of it comes right out of the stories because most of the most of the um, the entries in this book are stories that 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 students are, are telling about. Oh, this is what happened when I got this terrible roommate. Oh, this is what happened when I when I tried to take too many classes, or when I got mono and and, and missed mm -hmm. out missed the entire semester. And you know, so the the last cartoon in the book which is really all about kind of, you know, having survived your freshman year came right out of a story that somebody told. And I have a, a, a bunch of kids sitting on a, sitting on, on the college green. And one of them is kind of is saying, I can't decide whether freshman year was the worst year of my life or the best. And it's not, I mean, you're laughing, but it's not really funny. It is, it's, it's it, poignant. but, but yeah. it's poignant and it's true. And because mm -hmm. it's, it's like, it's exactly what somebody would really say, but sometimes, you know, the great, what, what, what's this, what's the, um, the phrase, um, the, the biggest, many a truth is spoken in jest. Um, and that's, that's exactly how um, I feel. I feel there's an ultimate truth sometimes in humor that, 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 comes out in a way that and you can say things when you're being funny or lighthearted that you can't say when you're when you're being dead serious and um and you and that's can, true and it comes down to that individual idea doesn't it just yeah. to be able to get that one thing across in that one frame right and but as far as as far as help as far as helping you know using drawings to help you communicate and people who say that they can't draw i mean in a class that i that i teach about 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 this one of the things we do is we talk a little bit about the sketch noting that i do at, at meetings and things and the fact is anybody can draw uh simple shapes and simple shapes like a circle or a triangle if you act, i mean I, I show people how like if you draw a circle if you just add a couple of little lines to it not only can you draw a multitude of facial expressions uh, you're starting off with that circle with just a couple of lines and that's what i love the most is actually just just showing how you can take you can take a face that's the eyes and the, the the eyeballs and the nose and the shape of the head are exactly the same but just by changing the, the shape this the slant of the eyebrows and what the mouth is doing suddenly you can have like 2,500 different expressions. Um, <laughs> I'm doing that right now, by the way. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But, but, but the, the other thing is you take a circle and with just a couple of lines, it could be, um, it could be a sun, it could be a target, it could be a wheel, it could be the moon, it could be the earth, it could be, um, you know, a pizza, it could be a balloon, you know, with just a couple of little extra lines. But then on top of that, you can have a whole visual vocabulary because you you also have words to help you. So if you if you if you draw a picture of the sun, you make a circle and a few lines coming out or a few triangles coming out to be the rays. Now you have a sun, but you it doesn't necessarily have to literally mean the sun. You could write next to it morning, or you could write next to it optimism, or solar power, or uh, summer. And so you're using it metaphorically, like you had said earlier. Exactly. Your audience connect the dots, but they become a part of the story that way. Exactly. And so, but, but, but the thing is that the drawing itself can be extremely simple, stick figure simple. I mean, Diary of a Wimpy Kid, if you like those books, those drawings, you can't be, get more simple than those. And that's a huge, huge uh, uh, hit. Isn't but the same, the truth? yeah, the same thing with a, with a, with a, you take a square and make it into a, a television or a computer or a, or a, a gift box with a little bow on top or a, um, 
you know, a, a, an envelope. You could make so it into start a, simple is what you're saying. Start, start very simple, but yeah. Geometric yeah, but the, shapes and go from there. Right. And the words that you put near it though, I mean, you could, you could, you could really communicate a lot of, a lot of things with just very, very simple shapes. And then you have, you know, you have, uh, uh, the, the 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 caption or the words that you put next to it suddenly that 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 television or that box means a bunch of different things. I think we drew a television in that in that in that uh, infographic that I did for you for your speech and 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 there was something about um, what was that? Oh, you uh, did. You actually have uh, you, there is a television. The very first frame you have a television, you have a smartphone, and you have an. Apple laptop computer and you the the computer in particular is very simple, but putting that little Apple esque type logo in it totally tells you what it is. I mean, just exactly. But the television there was something to do with the fact that I think I remember that that you know mass media. Yeah, brands used to own the influence of mass media, but now the masses are the media. So you've taken us from the television to the smartphone. Right. Now, I haven't actually looked at that picture in a really long time, but yeah. because I drew it and because I remember the picture, I can remember what, what, that's, what that point was about. Yep. Um, and that's and the you got a banner going across it that then, the mass media versus now, right. uh, with the, the people owning the media through their digital devices. And you got a dude, me, standing right in the middle, with, you know, <laughs> shoulders up, Hands raised, like, what the heck do I do now? Which is exactly what I felt like in 2006. Yeah, it, that's, that's so funny. I mean, I, I, I can see you, and you're describing it. I don't have it in front of me, but, but whoever's, whoever's listening to this, if you can see it in the show notes, because I'm sure that, that, that the park will include it. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's just the, the, the shapes are very simple, and, and, the, and the words that go with it, it you know, help, help, it, help it mean what you want it to mean. But without the, without the pictures, the words don't mean that much, and the and the words and the the pictures without the words don't mean that much. It's the combination. They really work well. That really make it work and make and help people, uh, like you say, enter the story and remember the story. It, you just remember it so much more. In fact, I think that there's a statistic that people remember like sixty five percent more when there's a visual element to to the uh, to to what you're saying. And the other thing that I do know, there's a stat that I know, is that if the people who who get who do trainings and things, um, they, uh, they forget, I think it's something like, like 70% of what, of what they heard, um, uh, by like 24 hours later and like 90% of it by three days later is gone. But if you add a visual element to it, that, that, that is way, way better retention. It makes so, it stickier. Yeah. yeah so, so one of the things you asked before is like, what am I doing with my illustrations? So some of it is, you know, illustrating people's books, you know, sending things into magazines where it really is, oh, here's a cartoon for you to, for you to enjoy and laugh at. But a lot of the work I'm doing now is also working inside of companies to, to help them, um, you know, their culture and to kind of visualize uh, solving problems, brainstorming, brainstorming new, new products and new ideas and new processes, brainstorming ways to improve their culture, um, and also just kind of taking notes at their meetings so that they'll, they'll be able to not only remember it better, but also share it more with people who weren't there. And it gives them a presentation tool when they have the visuals to, to, uh, to share with others. Now they have something well, like, like, just like you could do with your, with the infographic that I made for you. Uh, you could, you could then use it or, or somebody who had actually been at your talk could take that picture and tell somebody else what you said by taking people through the visual. Yeah. You now, see? Lisa, you have something for our listeners, a surprise for them to help them start in their doodle journey? I do. Uh, there are two things, actually. Uh, one of them is the thing I told you about before, and that is a, a little kit, like a video and a, and a little sort of tracing um, doodling kit that will allow you to help you draw a picture of your ideal client. So if you're in business for yourself and or, or you work with other people who are, and you'd like to uh, fit, you'd be able to visualize your ideal client and draw it yourself. Um, this will give you a little bit of a head start. So if you go to lisarossi.com forward slash draw your client, so that's L I S A R O T H S T E I N dot com forward slash draw your client, all or case, all one word, you'll be able to access that. And then the other thing I w I'd love to share is I worked with, uh, with Daniel Hall to create this really amazing demo and also a course, but this is a free demo uh, that is interactive and gives you something to actually draw yourself in real time to prove that you can actually draw. And that is at uh, realfastdoodleprofits.com. So it's realfastdoodleprofits.com, all one real word. Realfastdoodleprofits. That's right. 
Yeah. And then you can just, you can, you can sign up for that. It's free. And, um, and I think it's about an hour long and there's a, there's a handout that, that you can draw on that. will that people really, they came out of that, out of that, uh, training saying, I can't believe I actually drew that, but, but I did, that was me. <laughs> and, and you can do that virtually. So I can download that and do it right from here. Huh? As you could, as you absolutely, you absolutely could. I, uh, I really, I, I hope that people will take advantage of both of these things because it's when you do it yourself, when you draw it, yourself there's something um you know there's something that happens to you you remember things better and you're able to to feel more confident you know showing using using your drawing skills to help other people understand what you're saying and so that's that's uh, that's something i really enjoy sharing with other people well i gotta tell you lisa this is the first time that i've done a show where i've actually doodled all over my show notes here as, as you've been going along so oh, you've that's already good. Lisa, you post, post your doodles post your doodles on the show notes i mean oh that's my the, God. It's a little bit strange to be talking about something um, that's so visual when we're only on audio, but that's that's why it's great that you have a page with show notes where we'll be able to actually show some of this stuff. I love it. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for the amazing infographic you doodled for me earlier this year for my TEDx talk. I, I just love it. And it will be up so people can check it out. And I just I really appreciate you sharing this insight that you don't have to be wonderful at this doodle thing. Bring your own, be simple, but bring yourself to it. And I guess really arrive at the idea first and foremost that you're trying to capture. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, great. How can people learn more about you? Well, they can, uh, people, I would love for people to come and visit me on my Instagram. That would be fantastic. Instagram.com forward slash Lisa Rothstein. And definitely check out, check out Lisa Rothstein.com and, uh, and, and real fast doodle profits.com uh, for that for that uh, training. You're really going to enjoy it. And if connect with me on social media anywhere. I love, I love social media and I love connecting with people there. Awesome. And I hope to see you at Social Media Marketing World at the end of March again. I'll be speaking, giving a storytelling workshop again there. Really looking forward to that. Absolutely. And I think I'm going to be doing some kind of live, uh, live drawing at that event. So stay awesome. Tuned so that. people can meet you firsthand, see Absolutely. you in action, and you can give them even more tips to make us better doodlers. <laughs> I hope so. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Lisa, and thank you all for listening to this edition of Business of Story. If you like what you heard here today and you feel like Lisa could help a friend of yours, a family member of yours, or a colleague, well, share this episode with them. Let them uh, hear it for themselves and also certainly share the links that Lisa has given us for some of that free download and information on becoming better graphic artists, cartoonists, doodlers, whatever. And of course, if I can be of service to you, you know where to track me down, businessofstory.com. I have a number of free tools that you can use there to help you craft and tell your compelling stories. And of course, join us again next week when we will have another amazing storytelling artist here like Lisa on the Business of Story. And until then, you know what to do. Remember that the most potent story you will ever tell is the story you tell yourself. So make it a great one. Thanks for listening.